ah, now at least we have Polymake on the, <laughs> on the screen. So, uh, well, while we, while we are setting things up, I guess we can just sort of just roughly get started a bit and, and, and talk a bit about, uh, about Polymac, about uh, decentralized fundraising, how we, uh, how we sort of challenge, challenge the, the status quo in, uh, in the fundraising market and come up with a much more Web3 native way of doing, uh, of doing fundraising going forward. So I think, well, with my, my background sort of being uh, almost four years uh, at, uh, at Web3 Foundation, a lot of the things that we ended up talking about was, um, well, decentralization, decentralization, and more decentralization, making sure that, uh, that you can actually do trustless uh, and, uh, and transparent blockchains and enabling a vision of Web3 of a, of a trustless uh, internet where everybody actually owns their own uh, data uh, on, uh, on chain. So, what we were looking at when we were looking at the various fundraising opportunities in the um, in the blockchain market today is that today it's really difficult. You can say it's it's and it's not very blockchainish. It's very much of a of a of a centralized setup. It's very much uh, based on your contacts that know someone that know someone, and then you sort of can get into uh, get into discussions, but it all ends up being very much centralized and very much based on, uh, on personal connections and very intransparent. I think it's one of the things when you look at, uh, at, at fundraising, especially sort of before you end up on some kind of open exchange, is that everything is opaque and everything is based on uh, anyone can contact anyone and how can we actually improve that? Uh, and I think looking at what blockchain is really good at is anything transactional based. So why don't we have like a full-on decentralized way of doing uh, doing fundraising? So that's what we want to do with uh, with Polymac, and we want to double down also on the community part, because looking at blockchain projects today, um, one of the most or biggest indicators of success is usually around the community. Sure, you can raise all the money in the world. But if you don't have community, if you don't have users that actually are interested in your project, it doesn't actually matter if you got 20 million from Sequoia or A16Z or something. Well, you can use a lot of money on, on advertisement, but it's still not... For me, it's like everything that is around a blockchain project very much circulates around community and circulates around how you actually have a distributed uh, ownership of your, uh, of, of your protocol. So... That is some of the some of the challenges that we took on with uh, with Polymac, and I'll go through sort of a bit more on the focusing a bit on the more of the founder journey to uh, to how to actually build a successful uh, Web3 project. Um, but and of course, there's also a way of like, hey, how do you can how can you invest in uh, in early stage projects? Uh, and yeah, that's that's a part of it as well. But I think. Please ask questions or just uh, just raise your hand if there's something that you want to go further into. Um, I think we have uh, we have a full half hour um, and there's plenty enough to talk about. But I think we are a, a size where where it makes sense that uh, if there's something that we should go into more deeply, then uh, then let's do that as well. So looking at a bit of the, the journey to funding from uh, from a from a project from a project perspective. So some of the really uh, big issues that uh, that we see and what uh, what we also hear from founders when we talk to founders is very much it's extremely time consuming and especially these days it's also quite uncertain um, i'm sure if we look like uh, uh, two years back it uh, it was uh, probably a bit more certain or at least less uh, time consuming but uh, but because the the fundraising market was just uh, easily easier accessible but then again just getting a lot of money is also not necessarily what is, uh, what, what is the goal. It's also making sure you actually get the right money in and you actually get the right partners in. Um, so it also ends up for most founders and ending up being some kind of painful, frustrating, draining journey. Uh, of course, it can also be extremely rewarding and you can also use it to iterate on the, uh, on, on the project that you have because it's like, hey, you go through what, uh, what you're actually building quite a lot of time with a lot of people that can give you inputs. But... On the other hand, it's like, where is the time best spent? Is the time best spent when, uh, when 
when you actually use a lot of time talking to VCs, or do you spend a lot of time actually building a product and building the community? So, this is sort of the crossroad that you're standing at, and um, yeah, we usually call this guy Bob. Um, sometimes, sometimes he's called something else, but like I think today we can call him Bob, and uh, he's building a, a blockchain project, and he's sort of at a crossroad because either you go away, use a lot of time on doing uh, on doing fundraising, calling a lot of VCs, calling a lot of angels. Uh, or you do a lot of time on actually going f fully on on development, on community build, and actually building everything up that's around the uh, around the infrastructure or the or the product you actually want to launch. So, what what do you do? It's like do you go down the one way or do you go down the other way? Uh, and and for us, there is very big differences between uh, between the two roads, um, and very many sort of pros and cons on on where you go. So. <laughs> First, you can go down sort of the development and community building. I think now we're talking, uh, talking Polkadot, so I think we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of founders and, and projects that are very tech-focused and very making sure that we actually have the right product, which is one of the reasons why it's great to be in, uh, in the Polkadot ecosystem. So I also think we have quite a lot of people that will go down to sort of like, hey, we need to develop, and we need to make sure we have a great community around what we're building. So that will lead down the path of actually having nice project, uh, having a really a nice tech, but you also might end up with the uh, empty pockets at the end. Uh, and how far can you go down on having a great project without actually sort of running out of funds at, the, at some time? So the other opportunity is that you go down the funding path. So let's use all the time on calling a million VCs and having a lot of calls. Ah. We try the funding path again. <laughs> so you go down. This one has a life of its own. Uh, let's see. So if you go down the funding path, and if we get there at some point, then uh, we'll see what happens. Let's see. Um, so you might end up with a lot of money, but do you actually have the right project? Do you actually have the right product out? And when you actually go out, do you actually have a product that people want to use? the right tech, and do you also have the community around it? Because you can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have users, then you end up basically with a dead project with a lot of money. That can also be fun, but in the end, I think we're here because we actually want to build useful things, not just because we want to yeah, run around and, uh, and using, uh, using VC money. So, um, so the funding path also has its, uh, its, uh, its problems. So what are we doing on Polymec? For Polymec, we're actually trying to put together both of the paths of saying, how do you actually get more certainty in funding? How can you actually do funding in a much more efficient way? But also, how can we do it very much in a Web3 way? So how can we do it decentralized? How can we do it permissionless? How can we do it accessible and transparent for, for everyone? Because I think these ones are not only ethos that we live off in Polymec, but also ethos that really is the core of Web3 and what we're building. So why are we not uh, using these things when we're doing fundraising, when this is also what we are striving for when we're actually building our products? So here, we actually end up in a way of like, I can do fundraising, I can raise the funds I need over uh, several rounds if necessary, but I also have the time to actually develop my product and actually get the community along the way, not only in the usual sense of community building, of just getting ambassadors and Twitter followers and so on, but also how do we actually let the community in as being part of the projects and actually let the community also buy in to, uh, to what you're building from a very early stage. So, how are we going to do this? Um, one of the biggest challenges in crypto right now uh, is regulatory compliance. Um, I think uh, you've been living on a rock for the last couple of uh, months. If you haven't heard a lot of things about, especially the US cracking down on a lot of uh, projects, a lot of especially intermediaries um, for not following rules or, or not, uh, not registering with the SEC or, or, or similar things like that. So, for me, it's sort of like, it's probably a 
good way of starting to go down on this one, but it's also like you have to adapt. I think a lot of crypto projects uh, previously has basically said, well, we don't like regulation, so let's just not look at regulation at all. Let's just go <laughs> completely out there and say, well, regulation doesn't matter to us because we're decentralized, so we can do anything we want. I think we are probably at some point sort of past that, uh, that level of being able to do anything we want, but I still think if you look at regulators and you look at what they actually want, a lot of the things, especially when we talk about uh, securities rules and so on and, and, uh, and investments, is that the authorities want to protect investors in some way or form. And there are certain key points of that that, uh, that I think we can also now mimic as, uh, as doing things on chain. And I think with where we are right now in the Polkadot ecosystem, if we can actually have the technologies to actually go in and actually implement regulatory compliance on chain, but still not give up on the synonymity of acting on a blockchain. So that's one of the things that we do with, uh, with uh, Polymeg is that we have what is called on-chain credentials. And what we use on-chain credentials for is, well, first of all, it's onboarding. So for anyone actually doing anything on Polymeg, you would need a credential. And those credentials include your KYC. So you are still synonymous. But you have done KYC, not with us, with a third-party provider that you trust that you can give your data to, and then you can show trustlessly to us that you have done KYC. Hence, you can use the, uh, the Polymeg chain either as, an, as a project needing funds, or you can do it as a user wanting to invest in a project. The real benefit here is that you are compliant when it comes to KYC, but you also, as an investor, know that, hey, the project behind actually also did KYC. So the risk of them running away with the money, well, at least there is a record somewhere uh, that, uh, where you can actually see who actually wanted to raise money. And the other way around, like anyone that actually invests can say, hey, I've done KYC and, uh, and I, I want to invest in this project. So the project has the opportunity of basically being able to go down in their bank. When they raised a lot of money, then they want to go down and probably put maybe money in a bank, they more maybe want to put it in stable coins, but at some point you hit somewhere where they're saying like, hey, did you do KYC and where did this money come from? So we all with unchained credentials and the magic of XEMV3 is something that we have stored directly, uh, directly on, uh, on chain and is uh, fully transparent, but still synonymous for anyone that uses it. So once you have your credential, then we want to make sure that obviously these, um, let's call it launch pads. I think uh, maybe some of you have experiences with launch pads and uh, we don't really like the word launch pad because uh, then we end up being compared to launch pads and I actually don't think launch pads is not a good business model. Um, what, we want to, what we are is completely permissionless and you can do it not just before you go to launch but actually all the way from your pre-seed round, uh, friends and family, through, uh, through seed so your entire uh, fundraising journey. So it's not just about getting tokens out just before you launch, it's about how do you actually build up the community and how do you get the right people in to, uh, to invest in your project ongoingly. So what is really important is that we want to make Polymec a fully decentralized, permissionless uh, protocol. And what you need there is also, you need to make sure that actually, what is a good project? If I want to invest in something, or as an investor, hey, I want to invest in a project, how do I figure out if this is actually a good project? Is this something I want to invest in, or, uh, or how do I figure that one out? And this is where we end up in what we call evaluation. So evaluation is, on Polymeg, a, let's call it a crowdsourced, decentralized due diligence mechanism. So, if you looked at uh, fundraising platforms like uh, CoinList or something before, then usually you submit a lot of uh, data to, uh, to the fundraising platform and they do uh, due diligence. That is somehow opaque and you don't really know what's happening because it's sort of very centralized and it's, uh, it's the platform that decides. So for us, it's very important. I think permissions is not really something that you want in, uh, in blockchain. You want something that is managed by the community and something where you don't have like centralized parties deciding uh, who can and who cannot use the product. 
So this is for the evaluation where anyone with a credential can go in and do a due diligence based on their information about the project on if they think this is actually a good project or a bad project, this is something they want to invest in, uh, and they will actually pledge some of their, uh, or bond some of their, their Polymac tokens in return for getting rewards in the project tokens they're actually evaluating. So as such, we are crowdsourcing the due diligence information from the community and from anyone with different viewpoints on what is a good project. So let's say if you are a developer, then you want to go in and you actually want to do a due diligence based on the tech of the project that wants to raise funds. If you are a VC or an angel, you might want to go in and do due diligence on the fact of, hey, I think this is good from a financial perspective or from an investment perspective, but I don't know much about the tech. So by actually combining all these due diligences, then you can actually get a proper picture of if this is actually a project that the community is excited about and that has the right, um, the right attributes for, for something that you want to invest in. So you get much more, much more information on, on that from the community. And for the ones actually doing the evaluation, they can also make money on it. Um, so if a project actually gets a favorable evaluation from the community, then you proceed to the fundraising round. And here you say the evaluation round is 30 days. Or no, no sorry, it's 28. <laughs> so it runs on 28 days on, uh, on Jane. And if it's successful and you get enough backing, then you go into the funding round. And for us, the funding round is split up in two parts. Basically, an auction round and the community round. One of the things we saw in 2017 on the ICO craze and so on is pricing is something that the community is not very good at. Because there's sort of a thing called FOMO, and uh, once, you, uh, once you go down that path, it's sort of like, yes, I want to be in, and I want to be in for any price whatsoever. So that usually ends up being a problem for the projects. Because of course, yeah, you can actually go out to the community and you can say, hey, this is the best thing ever, you should chuck all your money at it. Then you end up with a huge valuation, but then that valuation is also something that you need to figure out of like, how do I actually sustain that valuation when I go into the market? So we don't see that sort of ICO model of trying to make a lot of FOMO for the, for the, um, for the community being the best way. So what we're looking at is actually splitting it up in two ways of starting off with a price discovery round, which for us goes into what type of investor are you? So we manage that with the uh, Unchain credentials and we are in the first round going in to look at what are institutionals, VCs or angels. They participate in the price discovery round or an auction mechanism where on a candle auction basis you have five days of, of these more professional investors can go in and actually say, hey, how much am I willing to pay to invest in this project? So they would run that bidding for, for five days, and once you actually have reached either the minimum uh, cap for the, uh, for, for the project raising, or if you go above, then of course the valuation of the project will, uh, will go up. And that is determined purely by the professionals. So the project can decide themselves how much do they want to allocate to the professionals and how much do they want to allocate to the second round. And the second round is what we call the community round. The community round is basically making sure that how do you get the community get in at an early stage? Because those are the ones that are important for your project. So how much do you want to let them in for? You might want to let the community in for smaller ticket sizes, but you want to let them in in larger quantities. So you can open it up for the community and the community will invest on the same price as the VCs, basically getting a weighted average of all the VCs that, uh, that went in. So as such, you can say the, the whole idea of VCs dumping on retail is something that we can go against by saying, why shouldn't retail or the community being able to also benefit from the fact that you can actually invest in a project that you like really, really early and since it's all managed on Jane, everything is re registered. It's, it doesn't really matter if you have 10 investors or 10,000 investors, because everything is managed directly on, on Polymec. 
And what happens once you actually done the two uh, fundraising rounds? Each of them take five days. So then we end up with a total of around 45 days to do a full fundraising round. What happens then on Polymec is that the last part, and this is also quite important, is the issuance and the migration of the, uh, of the tokens. So usually when you do pre-seed, seed, and so on, you don't have a live tokens, especially not in Polkadot ecosystem because, hey, you don't have a, you don't have a power chain, you might not have uh, something launched already, so how do you issue, how do you issue a token? What we're doing on, on Polymac is that anyone that actually does the fundraising on Polymac will get, uh, will be issued contribution tokens directly on Polymac. Those contribution tokens that will be sent to any investor basically is a representation of their, of the investment that they did, and that contribution token will be kept in their Polymac uh, wallet. Once the project then goes mainnet, then we will via XEM, morph those tokens or replace those tokens in every investor's wallet with the mainnet token of the project. So as such, you don't have to deal with this entire like token generation event, which usually what I've seen before is like you end up with a huge spreadsheet and then you try to do it correctly, um, which probably not is, is not the best way of doing it, plus the fact that you might end up having quite a lot of investors that invested early on and they're like, now I have some piece of paper that I signed on, and now I hope that I get some tokens back from, uh, from the project that I trusted with my, with my investment like a year or, or half a year ago. It's not very blockchain-ish, because like, why are we not recording this directly on chain? Doing all these papers back and forth is sort of a bit of a, well, remnant of, uh, of what, uh, what is the usual investment landscape. So we do the contribution token. You can see it as soon as you invest directly in your wallet as an investor and then it automatically gets morphed to the mainnet of the, of the project once they, uh, once they actually go live. So by doing that, you have the entire uh, chain all the way from the evaluation over the funding raising ground and also to actually getting proof of, uh, of the fact that, uh, that you invested. So what makes us different? I have no idea how much time I use, but anyway, I guess someone will stop me if uh, we are out of time. But um, cost and fees, this is always a nice thing. So for participants, so anyone wanting to invest in anything, there's absolutely no cost. So we don't want to, uh, want to take anything out of that. Um, if you look at it from an issuer perspective, the only cost that's involved is that if you do a successful fundraise, then we, we take on the protocol is taking a fee between 6 and 10% of the uh, funds raised in the native token of the, uh, of the protocol raising funds and are using those ones to incentivize the participants. So for the due diligence, for, uh, for liquidity once you go live and also for making sure that there's long-term holding on the, on the project. It's fully transparent on chain. There is full global accessibility. Projects can even decide which jurisdictions they want to include because they can manage that via the credentials. And there is a full incentive alignment between the project, between the VCs and the community, making sure that everybody actually gets the best out of, of a fundraise. And the last thing, yeah, regulatory compliance. It's all fully traceable. If someone wants to go in and look at the, uh, at the KYC at some point, then that's also uh, that's possible for authorities or anyone that needs to look at that. But for you as a project or for you as an investor, you're only sharing it with a third party. So as such, you don't have to deal with it uh, in, uh, in any case. Let's see if I can get the next one. So, now we've been through a lot and uh, I don't hear any questions, but uh, if there are any, then uh, please let me know. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we just launched uh, last week is that uh, we launched what we call a knowledge hub. Um, as such, we ended up calling it Wiki for uh, quite some time, but uh, we think it's actually more than that. And Wiki is sort of like, uh, yeah. Um, it's different what is actually included in that, and we see there's a lot of knowledge in, in, in what we have here, because 
what we start out with, we have a huge uh, learn section, which actually includes much more direct information about how the protocol works, how a fundraising round looks, and also how the how the calculation looks through a fundraise of uh, how is the how is the different uh, auction mechanism working, how do they drive price, uh, and so on. That is all available in the in the learn section of the knowledge hub that is currently live, and we would continue to add much more there. I think uh, the one you can see here is the technical documentation. It's not there yet, but it will be there in uh, in in due time. So. Uh, our social media guy is always nice on the, on the QR codes. So the QR codes will take you directly to the knowledge hub, but it's also accessible from our website. So just to sum things up, Polymec, accessible for anyone. Very, very easy to, uh, to raise funds. You have more of a fixed time to do it, and you can do it very blockchain natively. It's fully on chain, fully transparent, and what we actually call regulatory compliant DeFi, because you have a way of actually making sure that you have KYC and traceability on chain directly. And then the last one is obviously follow up, make sure you follow us on Twitter or sign up for our, um, we also have legal notes. No? Uh, yeah, follow us on Twitter or follow us on our, um, uh, on our um, email uh, list as well, then uh, then we'll make sure to keep you updated on all the developments on Polymac. Uh, in this evaluation phase you described earlier, which comes just after registering a project, setting up credentials, like is there some kind of mechanism actually incentivizing for like very honest and very high quality due diligence by the community? Because like I can imagine that in practice it looks like everyone writes something just to get uh, rewarded in, in some way. Yeah, there definitely. It's we've been thinking quite a lot about how to actually do this in the right way. So, what you need to do an evaluation is that you actually need to let's call it stake your Polymake tokens. So, anyone that actually wants to do an evaluation will say, "How bullish am I on the project?" And then, depending on how what you're comfortable with, you can stake a number of your Polymake tokens. If you get the evaluation right then you get rewarded in the project tokens. So 30% of the fee that we get in a successful fundraising round will be distributed back to the evaluators. But if they get it wrong, so let's say the project doesn't get funding, you had community members like, yeah, yeah, this is the best thing ever, just to go ahead, um, and then it doesn't get funding, then we take away 20% of the Polymic tokens that you actually bonded for the, uh, for the evaluation. So you are economically incentivized to make sure that you only evaluate projects that you think are good. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's one of the one of the elements. Yeah. Hey, uh, maybe another question to add on. Um, do you think this is somehow like game theoretical secure? Because, for example, if I'm a competitor and I see an uprising startup doing their first fundraise on this platform, then I'm actually incentivized to buy the Polymic token to just vote against it and then somehow give a signaling that this is a bad project. And then, because if it's somehow declined, then this is obviously a bad signaling for future funding rounds. So how do you actually try to prevent this? So what we do on the evaluation is that we do positive evaluations only, actually. Okay. So uh, because crypto is still, it's a bit of a, it, it's a place where it's quite tribal uh, and people are doing all kinds of funny, funny stuff. So it's like we want to focus on the, on the ones that actually want to evaluate what is good in a project, but obviously being open and saying, hey, I think this, this is good, this could be better, but that's still a good evaluation. But you don't want to have like, hey, this is a shit project, because like, that, how can I use that evaluation for something? Of course, you can still do it, but you're not incentivized to do it. Uh, so there's no, uh, there's no like eco economic incentive to do it, and the uh, and, uh, and and wouldn't be something that uh, that we would uh, would encourage to to do via the economic model we have set up. Yeah, makes sense. All right. If no other questions, then yeah, remember to follow us on Twitter, and then uh, thank you very much.